those of you who will travel to Iceland next month, a safe journey and a pleasant stay. I don't know how good the weather will be, but I know that you will be most welcome. And yes, I'm here to represent my country. What does that mean? My country, right or wrong. This old phrase can still be heard, or at least the sentiment that your country's interests always come first, no matter what. If not your own country's interests, whose interest then? But this cannot be the only correct approach. We need to talk about independence and interdependence. We need to talk about nationalism, the need for nationalism, but also the dangers of nationalism. I believe that the Council of Europe is a perfect venue for such considerations. After all, it was founded by independent states in the wake of the Second World War in order to safeguard and promote fundamental values and principles. The principles of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Principles of interdependence. In this regard, I commend the Assembly for its swift response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We must continue to condemn this violation of international laws and norms. Therefore, let us all hope that the Reykjavik summit next month will deliver clear results, a renewed commitment to our common democratic values, strong support for Ukraine, and solid means to ensure accountability for crimes committed in this horrendous war. And I refer here to remarks made by the Foreign Minister of Iceland in this hall two days ago about a register of damages under the auspices of the Council of Europe, but with broad support of leading world nations. Iceland counts on your continued support for the enlarged partial agreement. Dear parliamentarians, dear ambassadors, Russian aggression in Ukraine highlights the evils of extreme nationalism and the abuse of the past for political purposes in the present. There was a time in recent years when influential policymakers and scholars suggested that we were entering what was called a post-nationalist world. The Soviet Union had collapsed, the map of Europe had changed, the process of European integration was deepening. As it happened, this thinking was fairly Euro or West-centered, and it was also short-sighted and misguided. Today, you will instead hear statespersons, politicians and others talk about the rise of nationalism, for better or worse. Allow me to recount a personal and positive anecdote about the recurring strength of nationalism. I'm a historian by profession, and a number of years ago, well before I became president, uh, the Association of Icelandic Historians, of which I am a proud member, announced an evening symposium on the end of nationalism, admittedly with a question mark, the end of nationalism, question mark. This promised to be an interesting event, but when the scheduled day arrived, we all received an email saying that, unfortunately, the planned uh, evening meeting on the end of nationalism had to be postponed. You know why? Well, the thing was that Iceland's national team had a very important game that very evening, and absolutely nobody was going to attend a symposium on the end of nationalism. We were going to cheer on our beloved Icelandic team. So nationalism is not nearing its end. But it must be a positive force. Positive patriotism can and should foster solidarity and support for each other in our societies. It should enhance our love and care for our nature and environment. It should connect our past, present and future. It should maintain and strengthen our diverse languages, cultures and customs. At the same time, 
independence and interdependence must go hand in hand. We Icelanders, for instance, we could never survive on our own on an island in the middle of the Atlantic. Independence is not about isolation. And together, we must never forget the dark side of extreme nationalism. The disaster that befalls on people when positive patriotism is replaced with distrust, racism and xenophobia, with fear and hatred towards others. This we have seen in the past, and this we can see today. Therefore, our patriotism must be tolerant and inclusive. In my country, for instance, all citizens who want to live in peace with others should be able to call themselves proud Icelanders, regardless of their skin color or faith, regardless of other beliefs or whom they want to love, regardless of how well they speak the Icelandic language, regardless of all other factors and labels that can be used to divide people into us and them. Esteemed parliamentarians, as I mentioned, I am a historian by profession and by passion, but I'm also head of state. And this combination can be problematic, believe me. It could be argued that as representatives of our respective countries, it's almost written in our job description to be positive, to be optimistic, to advance the interests of our own country. Could you imagine if I were to begin my New Year's address by saying, uh, my fellow Icelanders, you aren't that great at all. My dear friends, this year is not going to be good. No. But when you're an academic, you're meant to be critical. You're meant to be uh, open-minded and you're meant to never think first what is best for my state. So, as I said, it can be problematic to be a head of state with a background in history. But it's also an asset, believe me. So, I'm fine with advancing the interests of my wonderful country. But with a caveat, we should combine our positive and optimistic patriotism with constructive criticism, an honest look at ourselves. People with a healthy self-confidence do not brag. They do not belittle others in a mistaken effort to make themselves more grand. They do not shy away from admitting their own weaknesses and failings. But at the same time, people with a healthy self-confidence can talk about their achievements and aspirations, if only to spur others on. And during this visit to Strasbourg, gender equality will be high on my agenda. And it's high at the agenda uh, of Iceland's foreign policy. Now, Iceland, Iceland and gender equality, this connection does not come out of the blue. Yes, we're a small nation. Sovereign state of fewer than, well, how many are there? There's me, those good people here around me, the Icelanders, altogether less than 400,000 people. Some things we happen to do very well, others not so well. But when it comes to increased gender equality, we Icelanders have been doing fine, actually better than most other nations, or even perhaps better than all the others, to judge from studies and assessments in recent years. In this field, we're leaders. We don't even need our beloved per capita to add to that. If you visit Iceland, you will learn that we Icelanders love per capita. We love per capita statistics. It makes us a bit more grand. We have more per capita statistics than any other European nation, per capita. Longest driven in Europe, per capita. It makes us grander. But our success when it comes to gender equality is not because we're better than others. It's more a case of proven results. Because the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, that gender equality is not only a matter of fairness. It's not only about human rights, 
Those are not the only reasons why gender equality is among the UN sustainable goal, development goals. Goal number five. No, gender equality is also a matter of objective interests. Increased gender equality benefits everyone when we all have the same opportunities and rights to show what we are capable of. Society as a whole benefits. So if justice, if justice is not considered a good enough reason, then surely money is. People prosper better in their working lives when domestic responsibilities are shared. If one half of a population is undervalued and not given the opportunity to show their full potential, the whole community suffers. The more gender equal a society is, the more happy and healthy its people are, and more prosperous as well. To be sure, there's still work to be done back home. There will always be work to be done. We still have to deal with domestic and sexual violence where the victims are predominantly women. Fortunately, we do have the Istanbul Convention, and I'm pleased to mention it here, among members of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. It is now more than a decade since the Committee of Ministers adopted this landmark treaty to end violence against women. It is sad to note, however, a rise in mistaken objections to a convention about an end to violence. So I encourage all member states to sign and ratify the convention. And I repeat what I just said, that there will always be work to be done. Now, with that in mind, the Icelandic Presidency of the Council of Europe has organized a conference later today on the role of men and boys in combating gender-based violence and working in general for gender equality and human rights. I would like to invite you all to join us at this event. Again, and finally, I am grateful for this opportunity to address you, distinguished parliamentarians. I take the opportunity also to thank the ambassadors present here for your help in gathering support from your governments for the Reykjavik summit. Also, I express my thanks to the Madam Secretary General, to the Secretariat of the Committee of Ministers, to the Assembly, and to you, Mr. Cox, Pini, to the Secretary General and the whole Secretariat for the excellent cooperation that we have enjoyed during our presidential term. And I also use this opportunity to thank our small but efficient team here in Strasbourg who are working so hard ahead of the big summit in Reykjavik. Yes, in three weeks or so, European heads of state and government will gather in Iceland at the Council of Europe's fourth summit since its establishment. Let us hope that it will be a fruitful gathering to the benefit of the peoples of Europe. What I know for certain is the established truth that while the Council of Europe may not be the center of power on this continent, it can and should remain its conscience. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Kairar Thakir, all the best. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, for your indeed most interesting address. And also thank you very much for praising almost, no, praising everybody here in the hall. I was looking to the ambassadors. They felt great. I was looking to our colleagues and I was looking here. Thank you very much. And we want to praise you for being here and being so confident that the preparation of the road to Reykjavik is on its way. You have... <laughs> That's good. The president said while his microphone was not functioning that nothing can go wrong. I thought this is interesting. <laughs> we, had some, we had some problems with, with, uh, with our machineries over here last, uh, during the week. Thank you very, very much, Mr. President. And you, as you as said, you have also said that you are willing to take, uh, to, to take questions. I remind members that questions must be limited to 30 seconds and questions are not 
speeches. First, in, the, in, in the, uh, I call Mr. Kimmo Kiljunen from Finland, and he speaks on behalf of the group of Socialists, uh, Democrats and Greens. 30 seconds, Kimmo. Yes, Mr. President, as we all know, Council of Europe unites the whole Europe behind the common values of human rights, democracy and rule of law. All Europe, without two countries, Russia and Belarus, which are not eligible. Nevertheless, there is one exception, a small country, Kosovo. And Mr. President, I will ask you as an historian, uh, how you assess the aspirations of Kosovo, especially Kosovians, uh, to have, an, as, have an access to our organization, our value-based family with its normative system. Thank you, Kimo. Mr. President. Thank you, friend from the Nordic region. Yes, uh, I understand that the Council of Europe is already working in Kosovo on human rights and democracy. Uh, but, of course, for any country, uh, membership has the potential to greatly increase the human rights, democracy and rule of law for the citizens. Uh, that is what I can say in uh, my capacity as head of state. Uh, I would have to refer uh, a more detailed description of Icelandic attitudes towards uh, the possibility of Kosovars to be part of the uh, COE human rights system to, to uh, representatives of Iceland here or the government of Iceland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Next question comes from Mr. Emanuel Zingres from Lithuania. And Emanuel speaks on behalf of the European People's Party. 30 seconds, Emanuel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good work. Yes. Thank you so much. Mr. President, Iceland uh, is a leading nation uh, if you are talking about freedom in the world. You talk about Istanbul Convention. During the bombing, rather, Ukrainian parliament adopted Istanbul Convention during the war, during the bombing of Kiev. And we looked to your Reykjavik summit hosted by you and by your fantastic team. Uh, like landmark after 17 years. My question will be to you about uh, not only Register, who is fantastic achievement for damages and accountability and large partial agreement, but about international tribunal of justice. We need to find a formula, and we expect it from your side to circulate, from your government, respected government, circulate the formula and to sign that like an uh, open document. Thank you, Thank you very uh, much, If possible, uh, I would like to, you to say a few words about that. It will be a historic summit Thank if you. we will have those two elements. Thank you so much for your support for freedom. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry for interrupting you, but we, we will stick to the 30 seconds, Mr. President. Yeah. I can easily give very short answers if you want me to. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, Iceland follows developments, of course, closely when it comes to the AM analysis, uh, when it comes to a possible special tribunal. Uh, but uh, we have joined a group of states working on the uh, practical and legal issues at stake, and Iceland will always support Ukraine. There can be no doubt about that. Regarding, however, the possible inclusion uh, of a language on this in the summit outcome document, uh, again, I refer that issue to uh, the Icelandic presidency, but uh, I think they will be tight-lipped until the uh, negotiations have concluded. So, no revelations now. Thank you, Mr. President. Prochaine question vient de Monsieur Damien Cotier de la Suisse. Uh, au nom du groupe uh, uh, ADLE. Damien. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, first of all, let me, on behalf of ALDE Group, uh, thank uh, the Icelandic presidency of the Committee of Ministers for the re remarkable work that has been done in the presidency, but also preparing the summit of uh, Reykjavik. The road will lead us to Reykjavik, but it doesn't stop in Reykjavik. There will be other uh, steps further. It goes further. 
And uh, my question would be, do you agree that it, it would probably be w wise to put an appointment clause uh, in the declaration, to already prepare the next summit, to take stock of what has been decided and prepare the future? And uh, the second question, as a historian myself, I'm very glad to ask the question to another historian. If the declaration of Reykjavik wants to leave a mark in history that it should address very important issues for the world and for the youth, like environment and the human rights, and like in artificial intelligence. Thank and you very much, on human rights. Mr. President. Thank you very much, thank you very much. and uh, uh, I uh, allow myself to agree with you that the Icelandic team has done uh, a wonderful work, but not alone, uh, because this is a team effort as well within the Council of Europe. So, so thanks to, to my good uh, Icelandic friends should also be uh, extended to all those involved in the preparation of the summit. And uh, I would uh, allow myself to uh, agree that uh, it would not be a stupid idea to uh, start thinking about the next summit, whenever that may be. Uh, these summits do not happen very often, in, as we have seen uh, from the past, but uh, the better prepared you are, the more likely it will be that you will get a, a positive outcome. And maybe this is something that our good friends in Latvia have also already given consideration, uh, taking over the uh, presidency from us in Reykjavik, and I wish them all the best. There is a cliché saying about us Icelanders that we do not like planning that much, we just go into things and see how things happen. I allow myself to express a dissenting opinion. I think the preparations for this summit have shown that we are okay at organizing as well. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The next question comes from Mr. Zolt Nemeth from Hungary, and Zolt speaks on behalf of the European Conservative Group. Zolt. Thank you very much, President, uh, both uh, presidents. Uh, my question would follow up a bit what was said by Mr. Cotier. Uh, President, I'm behind you, actually, uh, this, this direction, behind your back, yeah. Uh, uh, we have... Uh, uh, had our uh, last summit 18 years ago. And uh, I think in the past couple of weeks, the Council of Europe has proved that it is an important international organization, but we feel that without the summits, this organization is uh, lagging behind the other international organizations. So do you see it your own uh, 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 understanding that we should establish a regularity for the summits to be organized by the Council of Europe? And if you see yes, what kind of regularity would you prefer? I believe it is not just uh, an important job for the presidency, but for the committee of ministers, for the whole parliamentary Thank assembly you. to move on on this subject. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, Salt, Mr. President. Yeah, um, I think it's best to be honest. And I say to begin with that I have not given this any thought. And secondly, uh, I shouldn't give it any thought. It is not my role to uh, make suggestions in this regard, and I just say this in full friendship, but I believe that it would be appropriate for the Council of Europe, for the Parliamentary Assembly, uh, to maybe look into this. Uh, first and foremost, having said that, I should think that summits should be relevant and with an outcome with an idea, with a need, not just hold a summit because an X number of years has passed or something like that. So uh, as we are witnessing today, the Reykjavik summit ahead has a clear agenda. We are all determined to uh, see visible, viable, tangible results from that summit. And that might be the indirect outcome as well, that we will all see together that a summit of this kind can be a positive step, and therefore we should consider holding another one, not only after 18 years, but maybe slightly before, because there will always be challenging tasks ahead of us. There are some outcomes we like to see. The Icelandic presidency has placed a priority on reaching an agreement on a strong language on human rights and the environment. 
and some form of concrete action in this area. Uh, we did mention the uh, register of damage, uh, maybe a text uh, to support the children of Ukraine, and so on and so forth. So um, while holding the summit itself is a, a viable and uh, constructive outcome, uh, we also foresee some uh, lasting declarations that will have a posit positive impact uh, on this continent. Thank you, Mr. President. Last question on behalf, on behalf of the political groups comes from Mr. André Hunkel from Germany, and he speaks on behalf of the Unified European Left. André, 30 seconds. Vielen Dank, Herr Präsident. Island war immer ein Leuchtturm für die Freiheit von Journalisten und auch für die Informationsfreiheit. Der Journalist Julian Assange sitzt nun vier, über vier Jahre im Hochsicherheitsgefängnis in Belmarsh äh, und wartet auf seine Auslieferung, wo ihm 175 Jahre in den USA drohen. Diese Versammlung hat immer wieder seine Freilassung gefordert, weil der Fall ein gefährlicher Präzedenzfall ist für Journalismus weltweit. Was kann der Gipfel in Reykjavik äh, tun? Welches Signal könnte von Reykjavik hier ausgehen? Vielen Dank. Thank you, Mr. André, Mr. President. Yeah, vielen Dank für diese Sprache. Uh, diese, yeah. uh, I'll reply in English. Uh, a few months ago, I had a meeting with a fellow Icelander, Kristin Rapson. Uh, uh, I guess we can call him a representative of Julian Assange. Uh, Iceland is and will remain firmly committed to the protection of journalists and media freedom. Uh, on the specific case and its connection to uh, the uh, European Convention on Human Rights and the Council of Europe, I, as in cases before here, I would refer you to the Presidency of Iceland in the Committee of Ministers. But let me reaffirm that uh, we are committed to the protection of journalists and media freedom. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, if you allow, we now will take three questions together in order to make it perhaps possible to, to accommodate all the people who have asked for the floor. First, I uh, give the floor to uh, Madam Katia Polidori from Italy. 30 seconds, Katia. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. President. I took part in the meeting in, in this direction. Hello. <laughs> I'm here. I took part in the meeting in Reykjavik of our standing uh, committee that was to prepare the forthcoming uh, summit of heads of states. Among the many topics uh, uh, was that of combating violence against women, as you just said. I think that at the time when the ongoing wars have violated this social drama even more, at the such a light evil meeting, it is impossible not to talk about it. What do you think about this topic being present and relevant? Thank you. Thank you, Katja. Next question comes from Mr. Ahmed Yildiz from Turkey. Ahmed. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the record of the international community, especially the countries here, was not a good one during the migration from Syria. We did better after the Russian aggression on Ukraine but these migration influxes may continue due to climate change, crisis, conflicts, like from Afghanistan, from uh, Eastern Africa. What would be your suggestion? How, to, how can we best manage this? We should expect this. And should we insert this in the summit documents in your country? Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. And now the last of these three questions come from Mr. Alexei Goncharenko from Ukraine. 30 seconds for you, Alexei. Mr. President, uh, I would like to thank Iceland last month recognized Holodomor as genocide of Ukrainian people, but I want to ask you to make next step and to recognize what's going on now in Ukraine as a genocide. Something it's more important than just about to speak about history to prevent what's going on now. And uh, also, I would like to invite you to Ukraine. You haven't been in our country, and I think it's something which should be changed. So, and I also, I would be absolutely happy to host you not only in Kiev, but to see you, for example, in my native city, Odessa. Welcome. Thank you. 
So, you got an invitation and three questions, Mr. President. Thank you all. I appreciate the uh, questions, and if I may begin with the invite, thank you very much for the kindness and hospitality, and uh, I certainly appreciate the, uh, the uh, invitation. And, uh, would certainly be willing to accept it. Now, if I begin with uh, your question, Ms. Poldori from, from Italy. Uh, yes, I uh, was determined to mention gender-based uh, violence and the need to combat gender-based violence in my speech to this esteemed gathering here. And, uh, this is high on the agenda of the Council of Europe, as it is uh, in uh, people's minds in Iceland. But as to the agenda uh, of the summit, uh, I, I cannot commit to anything there. It is not my role. But uh, I hope I have managed to convey here in my speech uh, the uh, uh, high priority uh, authorities in Iceland and the people of Iceland put on the need to combat and end gender-based violence. So I wouldn't be surprised if you could see some uh, proof of that in Reykjavik in May. Uh, as for the uh, migration crisis and connected issues, I would again refer to uh, representatives of the government of Iceland and the uh, and the uh, presidency of Iceland in the Committee of Ministers. But let's just keep in mind the relationship between uh, climate change, migration, the refugee crisis, and also the relationship between independence and interdependence. If we are going to solve the pressing challenges that face us all together, we need to act in unison we need sometimes to make compromises, uh, but we need to see the greater good. And again, how do we do that? We do that by convening. We do that by having a venue where disagreements are voiced, where agreements are reached, and the Council of Europe is a perfect venue for such deliberations. Uh, finally, uh, Thank you also uh, regarding Ukraine and the uh, connection between the past and the present. Uh, I am convinced that uh, while I cannot uh, pinpoint in detail how uh, the war of aggression in Ukraine will be addressed at the Reykjavik summit, uh, what is absolutely clear is that uh, uh, the support of Iceland, and dare I say, or may I say, the Council of Europe also, will be manifest, manifest uh, at the meeting. So as I conclude, uh, I thank you for your attention. Uh, as head of state, it is an honor every day to represent your country. And when I think also about this venue, I see representatives here from other countries in Europe, and I hope that you will also feel the honor that this brings, but as well the responsibility. And I wish you all great success in your valuable work for your home countries, but also for the peoples of Europe and humankind in general. If there are any questions coming, I would be happy to answer them as well. But uh, let's, see how, let's see how the wind blows. Okay, Mr. President, you, you are surprising us but because uh, our, our members asked 30 second questions, but you managed to answer concretely, and we still have time left. So if you allow me, I would take three more questions at least. No, 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 please continue. We will celebrate this, uh, this fact because our members all want to ask questions and get their answers until now we are on the right track. The next question, I take three questions against. Next, the first question comes from Mr. Rafael Ustainov from Azerbaijan. Rafael, 30 seconds. 
Thank you, President. Your Excellency, according to a number of studies, Muslims in different parts of Europe are increasingly facing hatred along with discrimination in many areas, including the job and housing markets, education, and healthcare. The findings show that there is still a lack of awareness of racism and discrimination against Muslims in societies. Obviously, there is need for sensitization for more information at all levels, as well as strong public condemnation of this phenomenon. How do you assess the overall situation in this area and what could be done in practical terms to address this situation and ensure more harmony throughout the directly concerned societies? Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Next question comes from Mr. John Howell from the United Kingdom. John? Thank you, indeed. <clears throat> Mr. President, outside of the summit, what one thing would you see as the abiding legacy of the Icelandic presidency in terms of the role that the Council of Europe will play in European affairs? Thank you, John. And the last question in this cycle of three comes from Monsieur Bernard Fournier de la France. Bernard, vous avez la parole. Monsieur le Président, lors d'une conférence que vous avez tenue à l'Université de Cornwall en novembre dernier, vous avez déclaré que le nationalisme est une force puissante dans toutes les sociétés, mais que, selon votre définition et la conception que vous défendez, le nationalisme doit être inclusif, tolérant et compréhensif. Malheureusement, cette définition idéale n'est pas celle que l'on voit à l'œuvre aujourd'hui en Europe. J'aimerais entendre votre analyse sur la résurgence des nationalismes exclusifs, voire agressifs, en Europe, et sur le rôle que l'Islande pourrait jouer pour promouvoir le nationalisme apaisé et inclusif que vous appelez de vos voeux. Je vous remercie. Merci à vous, Bernard. Monsieur le Président. These three questions are uh, quite challenging, but let us try to rise to the challenge when it is ahead of us. All right, the uh, uh, issue of uh, Islam and uh, uh, a rise in uh, intolerance. Okay, I'll be short here, brief, but a thousand years ago, <laughs> the chieftains of Iceland gathered and determined that to avoid civil war, there could only be one law in the land and one religion in the land. So they cast away the old gods, Odin, Thor, Freya, Frigg, and said, we believe now in Christianity. One religion, one law. A thousand years later, we need to construct societies where, yes, we still have one legal code, one law that everyone should abide by. But a thousand years on, we can have many customs, many faiths, one law, many customs. And religion must never surpass or supersede the law of the land. But we should be accommodating understanding and never uh, accept or tolerate discrimination based on faith. So I agree that we need to take measures when it is obvious to all that religious discrimination is ahead of us. And you will find support for that in Iceland. As for the uh, question regarding uh, one outcome of the Icelandic presidency, uh, uh, leaving the summit itself aside. Uh, well, to begin with, I'd be happy to say, if we can look back and say, we did okay, we did well. That would be a satisfactory outcome. But you can also pinpoint exact uh, uh, or precise uh, achievements. Have we put something on the agenda that would not have other, otherwise been on the agenda? I, I cannot say so with full conviction because we do not know what would have happened if somebody else in Iceland had been now in the, in the row uh, of nations taking over the, the presidency. But uh, 
we took on this responsibility and we can say that we uh, delivered and to have this summit as well is quite an achievement. So I, I'm happy to, to uh, conclude it uh, there. The question regarding nationalism, uh, the answer there can be given in minutes or hours or even more. Uh, what I would just repeat and emphasize is the um, lasting need to emphasize the positive aspects of unity and togetherness of people, where we can speak of nationalism or positive patriotism. At the same time, we need to combat uh, the potential for xenophobia, racism, uh, mistrust, hatred, intolerance that can take place, that can happen uh, as history demonstrates and as the world today demonstrates. Uh, five years ago or so, I had the honor of attending a summit in this country, in France, in Paris, where we uh, gathered representatives of various states 100 years after the end of the First World War. And the president of France, the host, gave a speech on the evils of extreme nationalism. But, and he did so rightly and justifiably, and equally rightly and justifiably, he ended his speech with the words, vive la France. This you can combine. You can combine your willingness to condemn extreme nationalism, but at the same time show an affection and love for your country. If we are unable to do that, then I think we risk we increase the risk of greater polarization and strife in our society and in this continent as a whole. Thank you, Mr. President. And now we are going to try to finish the whole speaker's list. I take four questions, everybody 30 seconds, and then you have a few minutes left to answer, and then the Assembly will be more than grateful to you. First question comes from Mr. Enes Kervan, uh, who represents here the Assembly of Kosovo. 30 seconds, Enes. I do not see him here. Next question comes from Mr. Nikos Tornaritas from Cyprus. 30 seconds, Thank uh, Nikos. You. I, Mr. President, I would like your opinion on how best we can ensure the double standards will not prevail in the face of our common challenges. Violations of international law cannot and should not be tolerated. Whether this occur in Ukraine, Cyprus, in else or elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nikos. Next question comes from uh, Madam Zeva Jasko from Ukraine. You have the floor. Dear President, next debate we will have about, unfortunately, deportation of Ukrainian children illegally uh, to Russia. I want to ask you a question. What international tools of international law you, you can see that we will help us to return them back to Ukraine? Maybe not now, after some time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Last question comes from Yuri Kamalchuk. He's also from Ukraine. Yuri, your take, 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. Ukraine is uh, grateful to you for your support and shelter in, for Ukrainian families in Iceland. We are also looking forward to the Simon in Reykjavik, in, and I also invite you to Ukraine to visit Kyiv, Bucher, Irpin, and another cities. Uh, now, in the conditions of war, it is very important to, for Ukraine to preserve our own independence, not only territorially, but also economically. And, of course, uh, 
if it were not uh, financial uh, help from all the world, it will be uh, very difficult for us. And we have a reconstruction and restoration ahead of us. Uh, tell me what helped your country in difficult economic times to maintain a sober mind and make the right economic decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Mr. President, you have four minutes left to answer this most simple questions that you just got from the colleagues. Thank you very much. If I begin with the question from the uh, representative from Cyprus. A small country like Iceland, uh, if there is anyone who relies on the principles of international law and that international law should apply equally to everyone, then it is a country like Iceland. So uh, we agree with everyone who wants to make sure that double standards do not prevail uh, in the face of the numerous challenges uh, we face. Uh, the uh, history of Iceland uh, demonstrates this. Uh, if power rules supreme in the world, if force is the tool that works, then the future of Iceland is not bright. So uh, let us make sure that the principles of international law prevail. And they need to be defended. And how can you do that from Iceland? We do not have an army. If that is the question, if power and force are the determinants of the international system, as I said, then uh, we can pack up. And that is the reply uh, to that question. I could go in detail there with a detailed description of how Iceland has managed to create a sustainable welfare state. It all boils down to this. We must be able to rely on international norms and international law, treaties and obligations. And therefore, we will stand with all who uh, understand this. As for uh, uh, the question raised about uh, children in Ukraine, forcibly deported, if that is the correct phrase that should be used, I am sure that this issue will be raised at the summit in Reykjavik. Uh, and as for Iceland's support in general, uh, we have uh, a two million pounds contribution to the UK-led International Fund for Ukraine, and uh, this recent announcement brings uh, Iceland's total contribution to three million uh, pounds. May not seem big in the larger scheme of things, but keep in mind the uh, relative size and smallness of, of Iceland. We're likely to provide additional funds to uh, the NATO Comprehensive Assistance Package, I read here. And uh, we channel economic and humanitarian support through international partners, the World Bank funds, and United Nations entities. We want to support the uh, uh, rebuilding of Ukraine's energy infrastructure uh, through the Ukraine Energy uh, Support Fund and by sending energy equipment. Now, and as the Foreign Minister of Iceland said in her speech here on Tuesday, Ukraine will be the focus of the upcoming summit of heads of state and government, both in the agenda and when it comes to the substance. And uh, the Foreign Minister uh, made it a priority uh, of her presidency to ensure that the summit outcome includes meaningful support for Ukraine. And especially when it comes to the issue of accountability, as we have outlined here before. Uh, I understand also that Ukraine will be the focus of the working dinner of leaders organized by the Prime Minister of Iceland. And finally, 
to answer both questions from or uh, regarding Ukraine. Uh, I understand that the Committee of Ministers is working on a text to support the children uh, of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. That brings us to the end of the list. This is, this is a great thing for me that I do not have to say that I have to interrupt the list of speakers. You managed to answer all speakers, and that I think, according to our Secretary General, that is a record. So you can take that home with you to uh, your beautiful country of Iceland. But, <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. You did, uh, uh, you did answer all the questions that we had on our list. We are now looking forward to go further on our road to Reykjavik. You said everything is under control. We already have bought our tickets and made our reservations in the hotels. The Committee of Ministers is preparing the final text. The Standing Committee will be there with you, and I'm looking forward to see you over there on your beautiful island. And thanks again for addressing this assembly with your wise words and answering our questions. Thank you very much. Have a safe trip home. Next item on the agenda is a debate under uh, is a debate on the urgent procedure on deportations as forcible, forcible transfers of Ukrainian children and other civilians to the Russian Federation or to Ukrainian territories temporarily occupied. Create conditions for their safe return, stop these crimes, and punish the perpetrators. You find it in document 15748. It will be presented by Mr. Paolo Pisco on behalf of the Committee on Migration, Refugees and Displaced Persons. We shall also hear an oral opinion from Madam Carmen Leite on behalf of the Committee on Social Affairs, Health and Sustainable Development. After the rapporteurs, Madam Olena Zelensky, the First Lady of Ukraine, will make her statement. Madam Zelenska will address us online. In order to finish by 5.30, we will have to interrupt the list of speakers at about 5 p.m. to allow time for the reply and a vote on the draft resolution recommendation. Now, first I call Mr. Pisco, the rapporteurs. You have seven minutes now and three minutes at the end to reply. You have the floor. Thank you, Chairman. Madam Elena Zelenska, let me express, first of all, my gratitude for your participation in the discussion of this so crucial report. Dear colleagues, in one of her many incriminatory declarations, the Russian Commissioner for the Rights of Children, Maria Lvova Belova, said, and I quote, now that the children have become Russian citizens, temporary guardianship can become permanent. Madame Belova was just following the plans and objectives announced by Mr. Putin in his speech of 21 February, three days before the war, stating that Ukraine was inalienable part of the Russian land. That speech shows very clearly what Mr. Putin had in mind. The deportation of and forcibly displaced children are a tragedy into the tragedy of this war full of massacres and helpless civilian populations, bombing of hospitals, maternity, schools and water and energy plants, rape and torture, blocking of humanitarian corridors. This report focuses in describing and denouncing the practices of deportation and forcibly transfers of children and civilians and the breaches in, in the international law considering the possible crime of genocide. The exact numbers of deported children are not known, but it is realistically possible that several hundred thousand children were illegally taken to Russia, Belarus, and occupied territories. Russian authorities have stated that close to 800,000 Ukrainian children went in Russia, which is more than the double of the number supposed by Ukrainian authorities as being deported. As until so far, 
only about 20,000 children have been identified as being deported and less than 400 have returned to Ukraine, we must then ask where are all the other hundreds of thousands of children? Therefore, it is of utmost importance to know exactly how many children have effectively been deported, their names and whereabouts, and in which living conditions they are. We need to know how many have been adopted by Russian families and how many are in re-education centers. All deported children must recuperate their international, uh, personal identification, establish contact with fam families or legal guardians to be able to return home, including those who were in orphanages or pediatric institutions whose parents have been arrested, killed, or were in other situations. The Council of Europe, United Nations, European Union, the next Reykjavik summit should have an active role in the efforts to help Ukrainian authorities to urgently, urgently bring back home all children and in creating conditions to have an effective reparation or for loss and damage in general. Children are traumatized. They are being dispossessed of their identity and can't return home alone just by themselves. They need help. They need our help. Many of the children are being subjected to a process of russification. It's a huge violence to replace an, an identity for another, forcing them to absorb the Russian culture, language and values to become good patriots. The Humanitarian Research Lab of Yale identified at least 43 re-education camps in Russia, in occupied Crimea and Belarus, where at least 6,000 Ukrainian children were detained, in two of them with military training, probably to fight against their own people. The practice of deportation of children started already before the war and became more intense after the full-scale invasion. President Putin is in the head of the organization with the precious help of the devoted and very mediatic commission of Belova, together with members of the federal government, regional governors, and local authorities, showing the evidence of a state policy with a clear structure and organization dedicated to the deportations and forcibly transfers of children. We all have seen proofs as propaganda actions with Mr. Putin and Madame Belova defending legal changes for a rapid acquisition of Russian nationality for Ukrainian children. Russian families with smiling faces receiving at the same time for adoption two, three, four, and even five children in exchange of a monetary compensation. Children have reinforced protection under international law. In these practices of persistent deportation, we can see an inhuman intention to destroy Ukrainian identity with grave human and legal consequences. In these practices, together with the monstrous process of russification, we see elements of the crime of genocide, considered the crime of crimes, for the complete denial to children the right to have an identity, a culture, and a normal and safe familiar environment in their own country. The 1948 Genocide Convention, Article 2E, and the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court in Article 6E states very clearly that the deportation of forcibly transfers of children from one group to another is one of the elements of the crime of genocide. We therefore congratulate the arrest warrants issued against Mr. Putin and Madame Belova, recalling that many others with similar responsibilities should also be investigated in the light of possible crimes of genocide. With this report, the Council of Europe is accomplishing its most noble mission of defending human rights, accountability for those who committed war crimes and the right of people to live in peace and security.
the imposition of children must stop as well as foster adoptions. Illegal imposition of Russian nationality and re-education and russification must stop. All children must return to their homes or to a safe third country. To finish, let me thank to all those that have worked in this report, the Migration Committee Secretariat in first place, experts, our Spanish colleague, and the delegations who gave their contributions, and all the colleagues that will participate in this debate, aiming for the best interest of children and the respect of human rights and international law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rapporteur. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, Madam uh, Zelenska is already online, so she is already following our, uh, our debate. But first, before giving her the floor, I now uh, give the floor to uh, Madam Carmen Leit, the Rapporteur of the Committee on Social Affairs, Health and Sustainable Development, to present an oral opinion on behalf of that committee. Carmen, you have three minutes. Eh, gracias, señor Presidente. Voy a hablar en español. Eh, buenas tardes, queridos colegas. Me gustaría empezar elogiando al señor Pisco por su buen documentado informe sobre las trans deportaciones y traslados forzosos de civiles ucranianos y, sobre todo, por haber hecho hincapié en la dramática situación de los niños ucranianos deportados y trasladados a la fuerza a Rusia o a territorios ucranianos ocupados por Rusia. Ante esta tragedia, me complace compartir esta, su análisis y las aportaciones que ha hecho del señor Pisco, aun reconociendo que serán muy difíciles de llevar a cabo en tiempos de guerra, pero vale la pena hacer todo lo posible por conseguirlo. Sus propuestas y el debate constructivo que mantuvimos me han llevado a apoyar plenamente el proyecto de resolución y de recomendación propuestos, haciendo innecesario un dictamen escrito y enmiendas. Quisiera destacar tres puntos que para mí son de la mayor importancia. En primer lugar, poner fin a estos crímenes y conseguir una repatriación segura de los niños y personas afectadas. Condeno enérgicamente la agresión de la Federación Rusia contra Ucrania, contra su pueblo, contra sus niños. En toda guerra, los niños son los más vulnerables. Los niños se enfrentan a un miedo inimaginable. Los niños sufren daños físicos y psicológicos. Sus derechos fundamentales se violan constantemente. Este daño aumenta exponencialmente en el caso de los niños que están siendo deportados o trasladados por la fuerza a Rusia o a territorios de influencia rusa, porque se les priva de su identidad, de su cultura, de sus querencias y de su nacionalidad. E incluso muchos de esos niños son dados en adopción a familias rusas. En una palabra, se les reeduca iniciándose un proceso conocido como rusificación con el fin de que olviden sus orígenes. Los niños no pueden ser botín de guerra. Su bienestar y el acceso a la protección y a los cuidados deben ser una prioridad para las autoridades europeas y nacionales, para la comunidad internacional y para todos nosotros. En todas las sociedades, los niños son el bien más preciado, son nuestro futuro, el futuro de nuestros pueblos, de nuestra sociedad, Por ello, la prioridad es detener las deportaciones y los traslados forzosos de civiles y niños. La segunda prioridad es identificar y localizar a los niños víctimas de estas deportaciones. El establecimiento de un mecanismo rápido para identificar, localizar y repatriar a las víctimas es un requisito previo a la repatriación. Según los últimos datos, se están deportando a más niños que los aún decomuntados oficialmente por las autoridades ucranianas. Va a ser un proceso complicado, pero hay que poner todos los medios para poder llevarlo a cabo, para evitar o al menos minimizar los daños. La comunidad internacional y los Estados miembros del Consejo de Europa deben apoyar a las autoridades ucranianas en el desarrollo de un mecanismo seguro para identificar, localizar y repatriar a las víctimas a Ucrania o a un tercer país seguro. Como médico que soy, quiero subrayar la necesidad de proporcionar a los niños que regresen los cuidados de emergencia y apoyo psicológico continuado, que serán cruciales para reparar sus daños de los niños deportados porque se han visto privados de sus derechos 
humanos básicos y han sufrido mucho, lógicamente. Este mecanismo es una sin condición sine qua non y estoy de acuerdo con el señor Pisco en que la llamada plataforma Niños de la Guerra debe reforzarse. El tercer punto es llevar a los culpables ante la justicia. Quiero subrayar que es la que hay es una necesidad crucial de llevar a los autores ante la justicia, a todos los niveles de responsabilidad, ya sea ante tribunales internacionales o nacionales. Europa tiene que asegurarse de que la Federación Rusa rinda cuentas por todos los crímenes de guerra, crímenes contra la humanidad y crímenes de genocidio que cometa en Ucrania. Como guardián de los derechos humanos, la democracia y el Estado de Derecho en la región, el Consejo de Europa tiene un papel fundamental. No debemos permitir que ninguno de estos crímenes quede impune. Muchas gracias al equipo de secretariado y especialmente a Yanid de Bo por su inestimable ayuda. También a la Comisión de Asuntos Sociales por haber delegado a mí su opinión y también a los intérpretes por su gran labor. Les agradezco mucho su atención. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, uh, Madam Rapporteur. Thank you very much, dear Carmen. May I now formally welcome to our debate the First Lady of Ukraine, Madam Olena Zelenska. Dear Madam Zelenska, we are grateful that you are able to join us today to address our assembly. And we now see you on the screen. May I again welcome you. Uh, seeing you over there. We just were talking about the road to Reykjavik. Now we have found the road to Kiev, uh, and we are more than happy that you are able and willing to participate in uh, this uh, so important uh, debate. As the President of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, I would like to reconfirm once again our solidarity with Ukraine and Ukrainian people and to express the Council of Europe's condemnation of Russia's aggression against your country our member state. The Council of Europe was the first international organization, as you surely well know, that suspended membership of the Russian Federation only one day after the beginning of the war of aggression and expelled Russia less than three weeks later. And we remain, I tell you, fully committed to the support and assist Ukraine in all possible ways to ensure that the war ends, territorial integrity of your country is restored within its internationally recognized borders, individuals responsible for war crimes are brought to justice, and your beautiful country is reconstructed. Madam Zelenska, the position of this assembly is clear. This war should never become a normality to us. We should defy the temptation to get used to it. But instead, we should do our utmost not to ever forget about the suffering the Ukrainian people are undergoing. Just this morning, I saw in the news about yet another bombing of a residential area in the city of Mykolaiv by the Russian army that took away, again, at least one life and severely injured several dozens of persons, including young children. And we remember that these are not statistical numbers, but as your Nobel Peace Prize winner, Madam Matvichuk, said in her address to our assembly, there is an entire destroyed universe for the family and friends behind every victim. Today, Madam Zelensky, we will discuss the situation of Ukrainian civilians forcibly displayed to Russia and will put a particular focus on children abducted by the Russian forces. This issue is clearly one of the most horrifying in this war. We strongly support, Madam Zelensky, all the efforts aimed at ensuring the return of all forcibly displaced people, particularly children, back to Ukraine, to your country. We are aware of your contribution, Madam Zelenska, to these efforts, as well as of your other remarkable work to alleviate the sufferings of the Ukrainian civilians and to raise awareness of the international community of their so difficult situation. We are more than interested to hear from you today, Madam Zelenska, how we here as the Council of Europe can further assist in ensuring that all displaced civilians return home and all children are reunited with their parents in Ukraine. Again, Madam Zelenska, thank you very much for being us with, with, with us today. May I give you the floor, but may I please first ask 
to show our gratefulness for being with, with us today by giving you a grand applause. Thank you. I will speak Ukrainian. You have the floor. Okay, at first. I will speak Ukrainian, so please turn on your phones. Доброго дня. Вітаю всіх учасників. Дякна за вашу увагу до теми примусової депортації українських дітей. Ця тема дуже болить Україні. Тому я дякую за те, що долучилися до боротьби за наших дітей та їхнє дитинство. У нас кажуть, що живих дітей не буває. І ви зараз доводите це тим, що тут. Тому я вам дякую. У розв'язаній Росією проти України війні багато страшних військових злочинів, але цей особливий. Бо стосується тих, хто завжди найбільш незахищений, хто найбільш вразливий. І цей злочин тримає, триває прямо зараз, прямо в цей момент, коли ми говоримо. Я маю навести кілька історій. 12-річний Сашко був із мамою Сніжаною в Маріуполі, коли місто оточили російські військові. Разом вони пережили страшні обстріли, відсутність води. Тепла, голод, порання Сашка, поки їх не розділили росіяни, і їм не дали навіть попрощатися. Хлопці сказали, що мама відмовилася від нього. Росіяни говорили, що я мамі не потрібен, що віддадуть прийомну сім'ю в Росії. Це цитата хлопчика. Сашко зміг знайти телефон, щоб зателефонувати бабусі. Його вдалося врятувати, але мама ще у полоні російських окупантів. Інша історія. 12-річна дівчинка Кіра також була з татом в Маріуполі, коли росіяни почали нищити місто. Тато – колишній капітан збірної України з водного полу Євген Обідінський, загинув під час бомбардування. Дівчинку окупанти вивезли до Донецька. Величезними зусиллями держави, громадських діячів, десятків людей бабуся і дідусь змогли обійняти онуку через місяці полону, та невизначеності. Ще одна родина. Тато Євген, син Матвій, маленькі доньки Святослава та Олександра, також із Маріуполя. Після нищення міста окупанти почали процес так званої фільтрації мешканців. Мешканців, які вижили. Тата кинули до тюрми, а дітей забрали до притулку. Кілька місяців вони нічого не знали одне про одного. Діти знайшлися в пансіонаті під Москвою буквально за день до того, як їх мали всіновити росіяни. За цими історіями видно цю страшну технологію, як саме окупанти викрадають українських дітей. Найчастіше вбивши їхніх батьків або примусово розлучивши їх із родинами. А ще вивозять цілі дитбудинки та інтернати. Так трапилося, наприклад, на Херсонщині. Хлопчик Артем разом з іншими вихованцями Олешківського дитячого будинку-інтернату був депортований до РФ. Бабуся та українські посадовці знайшли його вже в Росії. Це історії, які, на щастя, мають хороше закінчення, коли дітей вдалося повернути. Таких історій у нас наразі 361. Але є більш вражаюча цифра. 19 тисяч 390. Кількість дітей, які досі в російському полоні. І це лише дані, які не підтверджені. Але і ця кількість не остаточна. Бо те, що відбувається з дітьми на окупованих територіях, невідомо. За кожною цифрою зламане життя не тільки дитини, а й всієї родини. Всі, хто місяцями не має спокою. Недаремно я акцентувала на початку, що це насильство. Насильство, яке триває прямо зараз. Бо прямо зараз якісь дитині... Так само, як Сашку брешить, що вона не потрібна, що від неї відмовились. Якась дитина, як Кіра, плаче за вбитими на її очах батьками. Якихось дітей, як Матвія та його сестер, готують до промисового всиновлення. Прямо зараз вони не мають зв'язку з близькими. 
Ось чому ми критично не маємо часу. Кожен день, кожна година в колоні ламає психіку дітей і родин, кошти здоров'я і життя. Тому нам потрібне не тільки занепокоєння світу, нам потрібна вся можлива дієва допомога з їхнього визволення. Потрібен не тільки порятунок, але й справедливість. Гайський суд назвав двох підозрюваних у депортації, але насправді їх тисячі. Бо це не випадковий злочин окремого злочинця, це ціла політика і цілий свідомий механізм тії і звідчудження дітей, позбавлення їх родин, імен, пам'яті, мови, коріння. Юристи ще скажуть тут докладніше про те, чому це є геноцид. Я ж хочу сказати, як людина, як мати двох дітей. Виховуючи дітей, ми всі хочемо для них кращого життя. Ми розказуємо дітям про добро та зло, про хороше та погане. І ось це зло, воно матеріальне, воно так виглядає. Не в метафорах, а в реальності. Ми, дорослі, так багато кажемо дітям про перемогу добра, правильних вчинків. І от зараз саме маємо це довести. Маємо врятувати дітей фізично і морально. Якщо ми дійсно дорослі і відповідальні, якщо відрізняємо добро та зло. У прав людини немає кордонів. І коли дитинство в одній країні під загрозою, воно під загрозою повсюдно. Небезпека для українських дітей – це небезпека для інших дітей світу. Викрадення дітей і катування батьків – це зазіхання не тільки на нас, зазіхання на все міжнародне право, на принципі співіснування. Це виклик всім. Я прошу поставитися до цього саме як до виклику всім нашим спільним цінностям, нашій уяві про добро та зло. Це той випадок, коли порятунок можливий лише всім світом. Давайте станемо таким світом для наших дітей, щоб вони знову повірили в цей світ та його людей. Після всього пережитого теж відновили свою довіру. Дякую. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Zelenska, for informing us and giving us the faces which, uh, which are uh, uh, behind or in front of the figures that you mentioned as well. That we understand that behind every figure there is a full universe and that this assembly, I very much agree with you, has a high responsibility to do whatever we, we can do in order to assure that this fundamental human right of children to be with their parents uh, is, uh, is restored. Thank you once again for, uh, for giving us this uh, up-to-date information. Now, first in the debate, I call Madam Zanda Kalnina Lukasevica from uh, Latvia, and she speaks on behalf of the European People's Party. Zandra, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, dear First Lady of the Ukraine, um, first let me thank also the rapporteur, Mr. Paolo Pisku, and the Committee on Migration for a very good draft of the resolution. I have to be frank. The use of the Ukrainian children in an attempt to attack the resolve and determination of brave people of Ukraine is the utmost and human action besides all the war crimes committed by Russia. I mean the killings, sexual abuse, injuries of the children, the unlawful transfers and deportation to the Russian Federation and Belarus, and children forcible placement under custody or adoption by Russian foster families. The so-called re-education summer camps organized by Russia are nothing else but propaganda and torture camps, both for the children who are under strict regime in the so-called camps and as well for parents or relatives 
who in many cases don't even know where their children are. This practice is clear combination of hostage taking, deportation and russification policy with prohibition to speak Ukrainian language or express in many ways or in any ways their Ukrainian identity and culture. This is crime of genocide under the Genocide Convention. Dear colleagues, last week I had an opportunity to meet with the father of three deported children from uh, Mariupol and the incredibly brave and bright kids. The family also just mentioned by the First Lady. The three children were deported to Moscow and were obliged to experience the so-called Russian care of the Ukrainian children. They literally went through hell. While the father was detained for almost two months, the children were told that their father could be dead. If not dead, then in jail for a long time, and he won't come after them ever. At the Russian presidential camp, children's day started at 6 a.m. Almost every day, they had a demonstration of Russian propaganda movies and movies about the Second World War. Some days, they were pushed to attend dance parties, discos with loud blasting music. Can you imagine this combination? The children have just experienced the horror of war, in this case in Mariupol, and believe they have just lost their only parent, are forced to go to dance party and watch war movies. Only a miracle helped the family from Mariupol to find a way to reunite. This family have found safe haven in Riga, Latvia. However, there are so many families from Ukraine to be united. Ladies and gentlemen, let me once more welcome the decision of the ICC to issue arrest warrants for the President of the Russian Federation and the Commissioner for Children's Rights in the Office of the President of the Russian Federation. They are directly responsible for the Ukrainian children's deportations. I would like to express strong support to the recommendations put forward by the Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe, calling for urgent establishment of concrete mechanisms and solutions to reunite the children with their families. Likewise, I would like to express support for the active role to be played by this organization in determining accountability and securing justice. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, this is our duty and responsibility to punish the perpetrators and help Ukrainian children. We have to find ways how to save Ukrainian children from the hell called Russian care, urgently. Thank, Thank you, you. Zanda. Next in the debate, I call Madam Yevgenia Kravchuk from Ukraine. Yevgenia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, dear colleagues, share colleague, um, rapporteur. I want to start with some uh, personal uh, observation from my family. My husband is a policeman, and uh, when there is a special code uh, concerning children, the crime against children, uh, all the crimes receive so-called alpha status. It's no matter, it's day or night, middle of winter, actually, uh, especially if it's night and middle of winter, uh, the special rescue team is gathered immediately uh, and no one rests until the uh, children, child which is abducted, for example, gets home. And, uh, you know, I even can tell it uh, from the phone when he speaks because he says, gather everyone. Ukraine cannot gather a rescue team to go physically to Russia and bring uh, Ukrainian kids back. But what we can, we can form the coalition of uh, like-minded countries, of like-minded people who share the same values because these values are universal, to put pressure on this world criminal Putin, who is, whose arrest warrant waits for him in The Hague. We also should use all the legal and all international instruments to bring Ukrainian kids home and their perpetrators to court and justice. The scariest thing right now, uh, which is probably, you know, Russia is doing uh, with abducted children, uh, that they are being re-educated, cut off from contact with their homeland, poisoned with the worst messages of the psychological techniques of Russian propaganda. In fact, they're being sent to a factory to, be, to produce a new person. 
a person loyal to the Russian world and also ready to aggressively impose it by force in future. This is exactly what Hitler and Stalin did in the uh, uh, last century. What are the Russians really by doing by re-educating Ukrainian children? They're not just depriving the national identity, forcing them to hate the land they were born in. They are violating and destroying the children's inner world. To destroy at least one child's inner world is a crime against future. But in the center of Europe, we have a machine, a state machine that kidnaps a child, destroys the identity, uh, and that's the, the, the challenge for Europe and for the entire civilized world, a challenge of barbarism and genocide. Yes, genocide. And as our rapporteur has rightfully mentioned, that the forcible transfer of children from one group to another group was the intention to destroy totally or in part a national, ethnic, rational or religious group is considered as a crime of genocide under Article 2, Paragraph E of the 1948 Genocide Conventions. And it matches with the documented evidence of deportation and forcible transfer of Ukrainian children to Russian Federation. It's important uh, that we call in this report to international criminal court to consider prosecuting Russia for committing genocide against Ukrainians. And it's important that we urge the state parties of the Rome Statute to take all measures to uh, bring Pre Putin and Lvova Belova to The Hague where they belong. And on behalf of the ALDE group, I urge you to support this resolution and I urge to combine our efforts to bring all Ukrainian children back home and their perpetrators to The Hague. Thank you very much. Uh... Evgenia, and you mentioned what I forgot and need to say that you spoke on behalf of the ALDE group. Now, on behalf of the European Conservative Group, we are going to listen to Madam Olena Komenko, also from Ukraine. Olena. Dear colleagues, the crime of deportation is a typical tool of Russia throughout the centuries. The Russian Empire, the USSR, or the modern Russian Federation, this country has always aimed to destroy national communities. Nowadays, with its la ma mass scale campaign of stealing Ukrainian children, Russia goes for its ultimate mission of destroying the Ukrainian nation to steal new Ukrainian generations. Russian authorities have interrogated, detained, and forcibly deported hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian children from their homes within Ukraine to Russia. This has included the deliberate separation of children from their par parents and the abduction of children from orphanages before placing these children for adoption in Russia. Russia applies pressure on children while they stay here, prohibiting to express their Ukrainian identity, bullying them, lying, and isolating them from any communications and on parents even when they personally come to save their children. Finding them and bringing them home is our top priority, and Ukraine counts on you in this effort too. Every operation of bringing children back is unique, complicated, and often involves risk to the relatives going into Russian territory and requires substantial resources. For instance, during one of the latest missions, there was a failed attempt to return two children due to the sudden death of their grandmother Imagine the stress she experienced to rescue her precious children. It is a story from Ovelia from Mariupol when he and his mother came under shelling when they were running to the apartment of their acquaintances to a house that was more suitable for living at the time. The boy was injured in the leg and his mother suffered a severe head injury. She gathered her last maternal strength and dragged her 11 years old son to the apartment where she later died in his arms. Then Russians took the boy from the friends of his family and took him to the occupied Donbass. We managed to return him and re re reunite him with his grandmother. There is also, also a risk that Ukrainian children could be eventually adopted by families from other countries. And we urge Council of Europe states to coordinate efforts with Ukraine to prevent this course of actions. Ukraine cannot and will not leave any child behind. Is this assembly finally growing a backbone? Do we finally have enough resolve to ensure the protection of children's rights 
in accordance with the law that embodies our humanity? Or does it just stay as so often words, meaningless words? I'm begging you for the, say, for the sake of our children and the survival of the Ukrainian nation. Please help financing and directing the governmental and non-governmental organizations supporting families in uniting them. Please help Ukraine to apply pressure to bring back all the actual so-called orphans held captive in Russia. Prosecute with us those committing the systematic violation of the international law. This is the way to ensure a just and peaceful future for all the victims of Russian crimes, and we all have a role to play in it. So let's act together, and let's act now. Thank you, dear colleagues. Thank you, Elena. Next in the debate, I call Mr. Bjarni Jonsson from Iceland, and Bjarni speaks on behalf of the Unified European Left. Mr. President, Mrs. Zelenska, First Lady of Ukraine. This debate is of utmost concern, the illegal deportation of Ukrainian children to Russia. Since the start of Russia full-scale invasion of Ukraine, evidence has been collected about core international crimes committed against Ukrainian children, and it is important to take note that the forcible transfer and deportation of civilians, including children, can be prosecuted as a war crime and as a crime against humanity. This practice not only violates international law, but it also goes against the principles of human rights and the best interest of the child. We must find out about the whereabouts of these children, even though the Russian regime will not cooperate. We must do our utmost to get the abducted Ukrainian children reunited with their families and relatives. A thorough uh, documentation of this brutal act is important for the children at stake and their families. But it is also vital for the accountability of the Russian regime for crimes against Ukrainian people. As stated in the report, the Council of Europe member states should continue to assist Ukraine and others, including uh, through any future register of damage, to record cases, gather evidence, identify victims and their current locations, and establish uh, communications with them. Continued support for Ukraine, accountability of the aggressor, and the establishment of a register of damages, the first legally binding act of this nature will be at the heart, at the heart of the Reykjavik summit. The establishment of the registry is extra extraordinary and the first necessary step of comprehensive mechanism for the victims of war, of aggression, including the children that have been robbed of their future. This vital first step will create the necessary uh, legal foundations for acting on crimes committed in due time. The situation of the children affected by war, including the Ukrainian children that have been forcibly separated from the families, will be on the agenda at the Reykjavik summit. Furthermore, the, the Committee of Ministers is working on a text to support the children of, of Ukraine, and I hope uh, for an agreement uh, by uh, Council of Europe in this area. Uh, and uh, I also have to say that new study New study shows a large majority of allied citizens among uh, member states of NATO support the country continuing to provide support to Ukraine. And I am proud to say the citizens of Iceland are the ones that express the strongest support. Uh, the international community universally sees the abduction of children as unacceptable removing children from their families or from care facilities and forcibly transferring them is by all considered a reprehensive act of violence. The forced uh, removal of children from their homes and families is a traumatic experience that can have lasting negative effects on their mental and emotional well-being. We must do everything in our power to reclaim the lives of these children and their families and to make the Russian regime answer to these cruel acts of war crimes. Children that are being torn from their families and stripped of their identity and future Deprived of the loved ones, heritage and culture, we must unite to bring them back, and we will. Thank you, uh, Bjarni. Last speaker on behalf of the political groups is Thorhilde, Madam Thorhilde Suna Evasdottir. Suna, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Madam Zelenska. 
for being with us today and for your powerful plea for justice for the children of Ukraine. Stealing children, robbing them of their families and their identity is not only an atrocity towards them, it is not only a horrible crime against these children and their families, but it is rightly defined as a component of the crime of all crimes, the crime of genocide. The mounting evidence of the systemic and intentional nature of these crimes puts a grave responsibility on all of us in our national capacities, but also in particular upon our international legal and humanitarian organizations to respond rapidly and effectively on multiple fronts. First, we must act fast to trace all of these children and return them to their families, or if that's not possible, to another safe haven. Here, our international institutions, and in particular, the leaders of this institution, must do their very best to establish a mechanism capable of this enormous task as quickly as possible. I hope that we will be able to take meaningful steps in this direction in my home country in just a few weeks. Secondly, we must face the facts. The facts that these systemic abductions of Ukrainian children reveal the genocidal intent of the Russian authorities towards the Ukrainian nation and accept our responsibility to bring the perpetrators of these grave crimes to justice. And finally, we must do everything in our power to support our Ukrainian friends and we must do everything in our power to fulfill our duty to prevent genocide, which is an international and a moral duty that lies on all of us. And we should not uh, forget history and we should learn from the mistakes of history and we should do everything we can with all the means of our disposal to stop these grave crimes against the people of Ukraine and against the children of Ukraine as quickly as humanly possible. Thank you. Thank you, Suna. Now in the debate, I call Mr. Lukas Savikas from Lithuania. Lukas, you have the floor. Thank you, dear president, dear honorable guests. I want to thank the rapporteur for brilliant done, uh, work done. And we all know that today we are all witnesses of a painful history repeating. Deportations of innocent people from countries occupied by Russia 70 years ago are happening once again in Ukraine. There are numerous credible sources, including International Criminal Court, the International Commission Inquiry on Ukraine, who have called attention to Russia's unlawful forced deportations of children from within Ukraine to the Russian Federation. As of mid-April 2023, the Ukrainian government stated that it had collected reports of over 19,000 children classified as deported to the Russian Federation, of which the authorities have indicated only 361 having since returned. This has included deliberate separation, separation of children from their parents and abduction of children from orphanages and placing these children for adoption within Russia. It clearly violates international humanitarian law as well as amounts to a war crime. Furthermore, the practice of these unlawful deportations had started before the Russian Federation full-scale aggression against Ukraine of 24 February 2022. These practices have intensified and evolved further since that date and are clearly being planned and organized in a systematic way within the framework of state policy. Policy which is based on Russification process, which implies a prohibition to the deported children to speak Ukrainian language or express in any way their Ukrainian identity or culture. The President of Russian Federation and President's Commissioner for Children's Rights have all been indicted by International Criminal Court. The victims and survivors of war aggression and atrocity crimes have a right to justice and a right to reparations. Therefore, we must support all accountability efforts. However, the repatriation of children, their rehabilitation, rehabilitation, the creation of conditions for family reunifications to preserve and to identify the children of Ukraine 
must now be a priority for all Council of Europe member states. I really hope that we will show our solidarity today and pass this resolution unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Now I call Madam Lysia Vasilenko from Ukraine. Lysia, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, dear colleagues. And today I am very, very grateful to our rapporteurs who have put together a fundamental report which condemns in the strictest but also in the fairest terms the grave crime, another grave crime, that Russia is committing against the peaceful people of Ukraine and against the most vulnerable of those peace peaceful people. This time last year, speaking at the UN Security Council, Amal Kouni called Ukraine a slaughterhouse. Ukraine become, became a slaughterhouse at the courtesy of Russia. And to save the children from this slaughterhouse, many Ukrainian parents have had sometimes at gunpoint to make the difficult choice of moving their children to safety to Russia. Now, the First Lady of Ukraine has given you a few examples of the cases at hand. And I would like you to imagine just now, as parents, what it is like when you stay for a month, maybe more, in the basement with your child, struggling to find food, struggling to survive yourself and to have your child survive. And then, one day, soldiers come, men in uniform, with their tanks and their guns, and they tell you to get out and to cross over the border, to cross into Russia. And worse still, sometimes they tell you to hand over your child and promising that that child will be taken to safety. It's a choice without a choice, really. And that choice without a choice has led to 20,000 children, Ukrainian children, being essentially abducted by Russia. These 20,000 are just the cases that we know of, that we have identified. There are hundreds of thousands more, maybe as many as a million. But we cannot say for sure, because Russia does not allow to monitor and to investigate the situation. Instead, what we know is that Russia has espoused, yet again, the colonialistic strategy of the USSR empire, where the youth of Ukraine are being robbed of their national identity. The children that we have managed to save all report being forced to sing the Russian national anthem, being forced to learn the propaganda from Russian history books. They are made feel ashamed of being Ukrainian and they are made feel fear of being Ukrainian. And this shame and this fear, it stays for lifetimes. It stays for generations. And it paves the way to the eradication of a nation. And Russia is doing exactly that. Article 2 of the International Convention on the Prevention of the Crime of Genocide, point E, says exactly that. And Article 1 of that very same convention puts a responsibility on the state's signatories of the convention, of which all of our member states of this organization are part of, to prevent the crime of genocide. I hope today that there will be a unanimous support for this report, for this resolution, but I also hope even more that we all go back home set to make sure to close this very sad genocidal his, uh, page in the history of Ukraine, but also in our common European history, and to make sure that this page is closed once and for all and as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Lesha. Now in the debate, I give the floor to Mr. Alexander Medesco from Ukraine. Alexander. Uh, thank you. Dear friends, we all know that deportation of children is one of the most serious international crimes which constitutes genocide under the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. It is not only our moral, but also our legal duty, obligation under international law to prevent a crime of genocide and to punish the perpetrators of this horrible crime, no matter where it happens. In Ukraine, in Burma, in Chechnya, in Rwanda, in Tibet, in Xinjiang, or in any other part of the world. I would like to emphasize the idea that under international law, a crime of genocide is a crime against the whole international community, against the whole humankind, against uh, each human being. Uh, and uh, we should do everything possible to prevent genocide, to stop genocide and to bring to justice the perpetrators. 
To ignore unfolding genocide, to stay neutral, is deeply immoral and amounts to being on the side of the evil. The perpetrators of the genocide want us to pretend that we don't see what's going on, thereby making us silent accomplices, accomplices of these crimes. One of the lessons of the Second World War is that humankind should make every effort to stop genocide. Unfortunately, we continue to live in times when the genocidal authoritarian regimes, one of such regimes is the terrorist state Russia, conduct genocidal policy. In terms of their methods and propaganda, all genocidal regimes are alike. To cover up such genocide, the authoritarian regimes use different euphemisms, and one of them is re-education, which in reality means stealing the children from their parents and by washing them by propaganda, be it a Russian totalitarian propaganda or any kind of communist propaganda with national specifics. In the face of the crime of genocide committed by authoritarian regimes, the humankind should have very clear and effective response. In other words, the crucial question is what we all together should do to stop the unfolding genocides. I am confident that a genocidal state should be totally isolated politically, economically, diplomatically. In particular, a genocide regime cannot be a member of the United Nations or a permanent member of the Security Council. And I would like to suggest that we start fighting genocidal regimes by severing diplomatic relations with the genocidal states. As we can see, the existing political and legal mechanisms of the genocide prevention don't function properly. That is why we need to create a new legal and political mechanisms which would be sufficiently effective and which would protect victims of genocide. I also believe that the Council of Europe can and should play an important role in this regard. If we don't do anything, if the free world will continue to ignore genocide or not doing enough, no matter where it is being committed, then at some point in time, genocide can come to our homes. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Now I give the floor to your neighbor, uh, Maria Mazenseva, Madam Maria Mazenseva from Ukraine. Maria, you have the floor now. Thank you, well, uh, thank you dear president. Uh, hello, colleagues. Um, you know, we are setting up yet another historical example for the international organizations because everything we are passing here in terms of resolutions are going further to the UN institutions, to the NATO, OECE parliamentary assemblies. And today is yet another historical document uh, which is at your tables. We are confirming that what has happened and what is being happening as of now in Ukraine, in the temporary occupied territories of Ukraine, in the Russian Federation, in Belarus, in Chechnya, in sometimes there are cases already being evident that the kids are being deported, Ukrainian kids are being deported to uh, Syria even. They are here said, uh, very well said by the rapporteur, by the migration committee and hopefully voted by us as a crime of a genocide. There were 361 cases, as the first lady said, the tears of happiness for the 361 families. But there are so many more tears of sorrow which will follow and drop uh, uh, further and further again. Uh, colleagues, we have already the ICC warrant for uh, President Putin, the empire of evil, and his so-called um, uh, lady for the uh, rights of children, uh, Madam uh, Lvova Belova. Uh, we hope that the justice will prevail, but what does this paper give to us as parliamentarians? Uh, what does this paper give to us to the families who are suffering? We clearly state, we call on the International Red Cross to use its clear mandate to travel, to get the security clearance to more than 40 camps of detention of these children in the territory of Russia. We call on the United Nations, we call on the UNESCO, whom we met, uh, the representatives of whom we've met today, and they are ready to help because these children cannot walk with their small legs to the office in Moscow. They do not know how can they report this crime because most of them probably have lost their relatives don't have uh, a contact with their relatives, and they're being lied that their relatives are simply dead, which is not true. Surely the Lanzarote Convention, Russia stays as a side party to this international document because 
many of these children are probably, as of now, might be misused for sexual exploitations, for the uh, trade of children, etc. Uh, colleagues, we have an important amendment at the very end of this paper suggesting the strengthening of the Coordination Council uh, for the Protection of Children under the office of President Zelensky. And I uh, highly uh, um, ask you to support all of the amendments that will be presented. No three minutes, no five minutes, not hour, not 11 hours of discussion would uh, tell us how we really feel, how these families really feel. But this brings us, this paper brings us closer as a chairmanship and championship of our organization to really bring every Ukrainian child back home. Please support this resolution. Slava Heroyam Ditkam Ukraini. Thank you very much. Uh... Dear Maria, next in the debate I call Mr. Uh, Mehmet Mehdi uh, Eka from Turkey. Turkey. Dear, dear President, dear colleagues, I thank the rapporteur for his work that addresses the situation of the forcibly displaced Ukrainian civilians and children. I regret that civilians, especially children, are always the most vulnerable group that are most adversely affected by the conflicts and subsequent atrocities. The war in Ukraine has claimed lives of thousands of civilians, including children. Moreover, millions were forced from their homes and became refugees or stranded in areas affected by the conflict. Accountability is also vital to deter and prevent violations of international humanitarian law as well as international human rights law. We call for fair, prompt and impartial investigations on all allegations of violations and to hold perpetrators accountable in a competent court of law. To alleviate the sufferings of civilians and to provide humanitarian relief, safety and freedom of movement of the UN and other international organizations must be guaranteed. Prohibition of torture and ill treatment is imperative, especially in times of armed conflicts. It is prevention starts with ensuring the access of independent observers. Since the beginning of the war, Turkey has engaged in facilitating progress on the humanitarian and practical aspects of the war. Black Sea Grain Initiative, led by Turkey and United Nations, joint efforts, large-scale prisoner exchange, including commanders of the Azov Battalion, and our proposal to set up a deconfliction zone around Zaporia nuclear power plant are instances, instances where Turkey, Turkey acted as a facilitator. We also hosted Russian and Ukrainian ombudspersons in January in Ankara. They discussed a number of humanitarian issues, including return of children and family reunification. In the period ahead, Turkey will continue its efforts in this regard. We will also continue to support this assembly's efforts to lessen the suffering of those affected by the war. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mehmet. Next in the debate, I call Madam Sandra Zampa from Italy. Sandra, you have the floor. Grazie, Presidente. Ringrazio il collega Pisco per il difficile e delicatissimo lavoro finalizzato a denunciare e a colpire anche in questa sede così autorevole il fenomeno delle deportazioni e dei trasferimenti forzati di persone di minore età, bambine e bambini ucraini, verso la Federazione russa o i territori ucraini temporaneamente occupati. Il 17 marzo scorso la seconda Camera predibattimentale della Corte Penale Internazionale ha emesso due mandati di arresto per il presidente russo Putin e per la commissaria per i diritti dei bambini, sembra quasi una beffa questo nome, 
Lova Belova. In quella sede sono stati evidenziati ragionevoli motivi per ritenere entrambi responsabili del crimine di guerra di deportazione illegale dei bambini ucraini. Si tratta di gravissime violazioni della Convenzione di Ginevra sulla tutela della popolazione civile e delle norme nel quadro consolidato del diritto internazionale sui conflitti. Anche la Commissione internazionale indipendente d'inchiesta delle Nazioni Unite nel suo rapporto di marzo ha denunciato il fenomeno e il Consiglio per i diritti umani delle Nazioni Unite ha approvato una risoluzione sul tema, così come ha fatto il Parlamento europeo. Da ultimo, la Commissaria per i diritti umani del Consiglio d'Europa, Miatovic, ha denunciato al termine di una visita finalizzata precisamente a far luce sul fenomeno, la violazione della Convenzione ONU sui diritti del fanciullo, sottoscritta anche dalla Federazione russa. Da sempre le guerre hanno nelle persone più vulnerabili, bambini in testa, le vittime prioritarie. Un crimine ignobile che deve essere impedito. Anche per questo occorre intensificare le attività diplomatiche e politiche, lavorando tutti insieme per ottenere la restituzione dei bambini alle loro famiglie e al loro Paese. Occorre che tutta la comunità internazionale si mobiliti e che siano sostenute le agenzie umanitarie e le organizzazioni non governative che tutelano l'infanzia e i diritti umani. L'Italia sosterrà ogni azione finalizzata a questo fine, perché cessi questo spaventoso crimine e ai bambini siano restituiti i diritti che la Convenzione ONU indica saggiamente. Grazie mille, Sandra. Next in the debate I call Maria, Maria Valentina Martinez Ferro from Spain. Maria, you have the floor. It looks as if Maria is not with us, so next I give the floor to Madam Olena Moshinec from Ukraine. Olena, you have the floor. I would like to thank the reporters for supporting us. Thanks to First Lady of Ukraine, Olena Zelenska, for this speech. Right now, my child, a nine-month-old boy, Bogdan, is here, having traveled more than uh, 2,000 kilometers to be with me. Unfortunately, not all Ukrainian children have the opportunity to be with their families right now. Today, the world's largest country in terms of territory, Russian Federation, is forcibly removing other people's children. At the same time, the Russian authorities note both an increase in child crime in their countries, country and in the number of suicides among Russian children. They can't manage their own children, but they still ours. We hope that more than a thousand pages of materials on the forced deportation of children submitted by the Office of the Prosecutor General to the ICC will be used to punish the criminals. The number of Ukrainian citizens forcibly deported to Russia last year is more than uh, 2.5 million. More than 90,000 deported Ukrainian children have been officially verified. In fact, the figure may be more than 15 times higher. The practice of illegal and forced deportation of children from Ukraine to Russia is a violation of international law. We are grateful to the international partners for providing financial support to the ICC to strengthen its capacity to investigate these crimes and for imposing sanctions uh, on uh, 15 uh, individuals responsible to the, uh, for, uh, deportation and forced adoption 
of Ukrainian children from the occupied territories. We also have great hopes for the Reykjavik summit and for the conference organized by European Commission and Poland, which is designed to unite international efforts to find children deported for, from Ukraine. Children are not weapons. Children are not a method of warfare and political games. Children should be resting in summer camps, not being tortured in filtration once. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your contribution, uh, Olena. Next speaker will be Mr. Alexei Goncharenko from Ukraine. Alexei. Thank you very much, dear chairman, dear colleagues. First of all, great work of rapporteur. Big thanks for this. And especially big thanks for the word genocide, which is mentioned in the text. That is very important. But we need to say after this, when we are saying terrorism, we know that there is a definition, sponsor of terrorism. But when we are saying genocide, there are also sponsors of genocide. So who are the sponsors of genocide? And I want now to mention one country, Hungary. Just last year, Hungary tripled their import from Russia. It means that average Hungarian every month is sending 18 euros to Russia to finance this war, to finance this genocide. Every, starting from a newborn, every month. And it's extremely painful for me because Hungary is our neighbor. I can understand why some people in Brazil, maybe they don't realize who are the Russians, what they are doing. Maybe for them Russia is Matryoshka and Bali in Bolshoi theater. But people from Hungary, they know what is Russia. Because not like Russians never raped women in Rio de Janeiro, but Russian tankies killed people in Budapest in 1956. Russian people and Russian army killed people in Hungary in 1848. For several times already in Hungarian history, their liberty, their future was taken by Russia and destroyed. And after this, we see all these statements, oh no, we will not say, that is some war, that is not about us, we need cheap Russian gas. So, dear Hungarians, you are exchanging cheap Russian gas on our children? Are you serious about this? I'm shocked because I understand when Budapest was occupied by uh, Russian tanks, that was clear, but it looks like that today, Hungary is occupied by cheap Russian gas. Is it real liberty if your decisions are dictated by just on price of gas? I can't, I can't understand why people can be afraid of tank. I saw it by my own eyes as millions of Ukrainians. But I can't understand how people can be terrified and their way of life can be dictated by price on gas. That's something which should not happen, according to Christian traditions about which Prime Minister Orban is saying all the time. How Minister of Foreign Affairs Siyarta can come to Moscow when already International Criminal Court issued a warrant on Putin. How it can be? Just can somebody explain it to me? So I address to Hungarians, it's never late to fix the mistakes. Please do it. Fix the mistakes, stand with the free world, stand with Ukraine, stand with your neighbor, let us protect the freedom democracy. That is the best pragmatic option for Hungary too. And together we will win. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexei. Um, I heard that it is your opinion about uh, Ukraine, but to say that a member state is a sponsor of genocide, that is your opinion, you're entitled to, but we should take care by using words here in this assembly. Having said that, I, uh, maintenant, uh, uh, le prochain orateur est Monsieur Didier de Ma 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 Marie, Marie de la France. Uh, vous avez la parole, uh, Monsieur uh, Didier. Merci, Monsieur le Président, chers collègues. Je remercie à mon tour notre collègue Paolo Pisco pour son rapport et Madame Zelenska pour son émouvante intervention qui souligne l'ampleur des déportations et transferts forcés d'enfants ukrainiens vers la Fédération de Russie ou les territoires ukrainiens temporairement occupés. C'est un sujet sur lequel le Sénat français a pris récemment position en adoptant une résolution condamnant les agissements de la Russie. 
Et je suis heureux que notre Assemblée adopte à son tour une position forte tant le sujet est grave. De nombreux chiffres ont circulé. Le rapport qui nous est soumis retient l'hypothèse de plus de 19 000 enfants déportés. Ils sont vraisemblablement plus nombreux. Comme le souligne notre rapporteur, ces déportations relèvent d'une politique d'État systématique. C'est l'avenir de l'Ukraine que la Russie tente d'affaiblir en la privant de futures forces vives. C'est la culture ukrainienne qu'elle veut atteindre. Mais c'est aussi une Russie en proie à de graves problèmes démographiques qui veut se renforcer. De nombreux enfants déportés sont placés dans des familles d'accueil ou hébergés dans des camps où ils suivent un processus de russification accéléré pour tenter de les couper durablement de leur pays, de leurs origines. Il ne s'agit pas d'un déplacement humanitaire pour préserver la vie d'enfants confrontés à la guerre. Il s'agit bien d'un crime de guerre, d'un crime contre l'humanité, d'un crime de génocide au regard de la Convention de 48. Face à cette situation, notre réaction doit être claire et unanime. Et j'invite tous nos parlements à adopter des résolutions condamnant ces crimes et appelant la Russie à cesser immédiatement ceci et à restituer ces enfants à leurs parents et à leur pays. Je me félicite que la Cour pénale internationale ait émis des mandats d'arrêt contre M. Poutine et Mme Vlova Belova. Au-delà, ce sont tous les responsables des déportations d'enfants ukrainiens qui doivent être poursuivis. Tous les États partis au statut de Rome doivent assurer l'exécution de ces mandats d'arrêt et faire en sorte que tous les responsables des déportations d'enfants ukrainiens soient poursuivis. J'appelle les États membres du Conseil de l'Europe à mettre en œuvre tous les moyens à leur disposition, en coopération avec les autorités ukrainiennes, pour identifier, documenter et recenser tous les cas de transfert forcé et de déportation d'enfants engagés par la Russie depuis le début du conflit. La création d'un registre des dommages serait une contribution importante du Conseil de l'Europe et je forme le vœu qu'il soit établi rapidement. Notre engagement doit être sans faille et une perspective doit nous guider, celle du rapatriement des enfants déportés afin qu'ils puissent demain vivre dans leur pays, retrouver leurs parents et vivre dans ce qui est et restera l'Ukraine. Merci. Merci à vous, Didier. Now I call on the debate, Mr. Jacek Protasevich from uh, Poland. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, colleagues, members of the Council of Europe. First of all, allow me to start with expressing my sincere gratitude to Madame Zelenska, First Lady of Ukraine, for her moving speech delivered to our chamber a while ago. Real examples of children being victims of Russian invaders who, are, who were present during her speech have been, I believe, for all of us gathered here in the hemicycle, very touching. Secondly, let me also thank to Paolo Pisco, the author of the draft report on deportations and forcible transfer of Ukrainian children and other civilians to Russian Federation or to Ukrainian territories temporarily occupied, create conditions for the safe return, stop these crimes and punish the perpetrators. I do agree, Paolo, with you and with your opening statement of that report. Aggression against Ukraine of February 24th last year represents a massive and ongoing violation of international law and a tragedy of human suffering. One of the most shameful examples of Russian crime against humanity is simply kidnapping Ukrainian children from elderly ages until the age of 17 years old and transferring them to Russian families, orphanages or youth camps located in territories controlled by Russian Federation. The cynical goal of those illegal practices is to impose an indoctrination on them in order to brought up new Russian citizens full of a hatred to their homeland or even parents, as they are very often told to be abandoned and forgotten by them. Those crimes were already firmly condemned by both the United Nations and our Council, the European Parliament, as well as Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, as violations of different conventions and particularly the UN, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, once signed by Russia Federation itself. As, though, as those practices are organized and carried out in a systematic way, with at least 20,000 children deported to Russia, we observe, in fact, 
a state-designed policy of kidnapping children, and that is why the Russian government must be perceived as a terrorist one. And members of the regime, including Maria Alexeyevna Lvova Bielova, Russian Commissioner for Children's Rights in the office of the President of the Russian Federation, along with Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, should be brought to the International Criminal Court that already issued a proper arrest warrant against them. And finally, following the request of Maria Menslova, I would like to declare, to declare my support for amendments submitted by the Ukrainian delegation to this draft uh, report, because, for instance, by mentioning Alexander Lukashenko, those amendments include also other people involved in that criminal activity. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are going to listen to Mr. Kimmel Kiljunen from Finland. Kimmel. Mr. President, I see the time, I see the time constraints, and I try to be very short, knowing that the speaker's list is still very long. As the Mr. President, you know very well, when we are discussing countries like Belarus and countries like Russia, we are frequently saying that the place for politicians is in parliament, not in exile or in, uh, or in, in prison. That's the basics in any democratic society in, in politics. Mr. President, you know similarly well that the place for a child is in home, in secure family environment, not in some alien environment, alien families, alien countries. That's the basics of human life. Who breaks that one, breaks some very, very essential in human dignity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kimo. Now we are going to listen to uh, Mr. Emanuel Singers from Lithuania. Emanuel, you share the floor. Thank you, <clears throat> dear colleagues. Just the president, uh, lady number one, uh, mentioned 19,390 kidnapped children, only 361 returned to Ukraine. Means 20,000 Ukrainian children they are in the hands of ideology who is producing hatred. Hatred inside of Russia in preparation to the second and third war who will be after Ukrainian war turned against us. Mr. Putin just a few days ago, uh, dear president, announced that uh, new pioneer organizations will be established in Russia with absolutely crystal clear Russian mirror ideology. My mother faced years and years in, in Nazi concentration camps in Germany after ghetto. And she told me the stories about the guys who were from Hitler Jugend, raising hands for Adolf Hitler. So we are repeating the Hitler Jugend stories with Russian pioneers uh, overbooked with uh, expansionist Russian ideology and children, Ukrainian children, who stopped to listen to the lullabies in Ukrainian language and switched it not only to Russian language, but the ideology were put it for all Russia territory, including Buryat children, including Chechen children, including Russian children, where you have <coughs> Maslikova case when for one drawing about freedom of Ukraine, all family were, father was detained and arrested. Mr. Chairman, uh, dear friends, we just uh, uh, spent the story 25 years of Lukashenko regime. What he did with Belarusian children, what he, uh, <coughs> in closing 200 Belarusian national language schools and turning them to Russian school and then turning them to the Ruski Mir ideology. Poland and Lithuania is on the border with Belarus and we're facing new militarized in the fascist hatred way, Belarusian generation. Ukraine children should be saved from the two items, 
A and B, to be kidnapped, having their rights for Ukrainian national <clears throat> identity, and third, to be saved from hatred. Hatred spread by Mr. Putin in every corner of Russia. In front of us, we have all, and especially in this fantastic report, who I am supporting from my deep heart, and amendments, very good amendments. The Lemkin formulation, formulation of genocide, 1948, by United Nations. So if Russia withdraw from Council of Europe, but Russia still is a member and now is of United Nations, and this uh, genocide convention was created like an echo to Second World War by Jewish guy, Mr. Lemkin, who family say were, um, were um, surviving Second Holocaust. Thank you, Emmanuel. So for that reason, I am asking to support this fantastic report and Thank the you. amendments. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to give as many people the floor as possible if we stick to the speaking time. Prochain orateur, Monsieur Claude Kern de la France. Claude. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Mes chers collègues, je remercie... Uh, notre collègue Paolo Pisco pour euh, ce rapport qui appelle une réponse claire contre les déportations et transferts forcés d'enfants et d'autres civils ukrainiens vers la Fédération de Russie ou les territoires ukrainiens temporairement occupés. J'ai moi-même été le rapporteur d'une résolution sur ce sujet adoptée par le Sénat français à l'initiative de notre collègue André Gatola. Je rappelle que les enfants sont particulièrement protégés par le droit international qu'il s'agisse du droit de la guerre ou du droit international humanitaire, régi notamment par les conventions de Genève du 12 août 1949, mais aussi bien sûr par la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'homme de 1948 et par la Convention internationale relative aux droits de l'enfant. Tous ces textes ratifiés par la Russie. Ils le sont aussi par les traités et les textes européens. À la différence des combattants qui, une fois capturés, sont détenus comme prisonniers de guerre, et peuvent être déplacés vers le territoire ennemi, le transfert forcé de civils et notamment d'enfants est interdit par le droit international humanitaire et peut donner lieu à des poursuites en tant que crime de guerre et crime contre l'humanité. La Cour pénale internationale a émis des mandats d'arrêt contre Vladimir Poutine et contre Maria Lova Belova, la commissaire présidentielle russe aux droits de l'enfant. C'est un acte très important mais il faut maintenant faire en sorte qu'il soit suivi d'effets. Ces deux figures sont évidemment les plus symboliques, mais il faudra s'attaquer à l'ensemble de la chaîne des responsables de la mise en œuvre de cette politique d'État. Maria Lova Belova a été sanctionnée par l'Union européenne dans le cadre du septième train de sanctions adopté en juillet 2022. Je considère que le train de sanctions adopté par l'Union européenne devra être élargi afin de viser l'ensemble des, des responsables du système de déportation d'enfants et de civils. J'appelle également tous les États membres du Conseil de l'Europe et l'Union européenne à mettre en œuvre tous les moyens techniques et humains à leur disposition en coopération avec les autorités ukrainiennes pour documenter et recenser tous les cas de transfert forcé et de déportation d'enfants. Ce génocide, ces crimes ne peuvent pas, ne doivent pas rester impunis. Mais l'objectif ultime, au-delà du jugement de ces criminels de guerre, c'est bien le retour des enfants déportés en Ukraine, afin qu'ils puissent demain y construire leur avenir et participer au développement de leur pays et au rayonnement de la culture dont on essaye de les priver. Ce sera certainement un combat long et difficile, mais notre détermination doit être sans faille. Je vous remercie. Merci à vous, cher Claude. Now I call in the debate Mr. Pavlo Susko from Ukraine. Pa Pavlo, you have the floor. Thank you, dear Mr. President, dear colleagues. The topic we are debating on today terrifies me as a father, as a Ukrainian and a human being. In the middle of Europe, thousands of children are being abducted and forcibly uh, taken away from their parents and their homeland. As per the National Police of Ukraine, around 19,000 children have been illegally deported to Russia. However, due to the importer occupation of Ukrainian territories and the lack of, the, lack of data, the number can be much higher. Therefore, we call on the Russian Federation to respect of its obligations under international law and immediately stop deportation 
of Ukrainian children to its ter territory or to territories under its control, to immediately notify the names and locations of all already deported children and to provide the opportunity and assistance for their return to Ukraine. The international community is united in addressing this problem and we appreciate the, the support and assistance provided to Ukraine in this regard. Taking all of the issues in account, it is special to focus on strong, strong multi-level cooperation between different states, international organizations, and civil society to gain access to, to these adopted children, verify the conditions of their detention and safety, and eventually to bring them back home and reunite with their families. Member states have to play a crucial role in supporting Ukraine's efforts to develop a clear and effective legal and political mechanism that, they, that will ensure the safe return of Ukrainian children who were illegally deported to Russia. Let us stand together to put an end to this crime and ensure that justice is served for those who were affected and that, that the perpetrators at all levels are identified and brought to justice. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pardo. Next on the list is Mr. Ander Gomez Reno from Spain, but I do not see him here, so je passe la parole à Monsieur Stéphane Bergeron de la Canada. Stéphane, vous avez la parole. Le micro. Voilà. Comme vous le savez sans doute, le 17 mars dernier, les juges de la Cour pénale internationale ont pris la décision extraordinaire d'émettre des mandats d'arrêt contre le président russe Vladimir Poutine et Maria Lvova Belova, sa commissaire aux droits de l'enfant. Ils sont accusés, et je cite, « du crime de guerre de déportation illégale de population et du crime de guerre de transfert illégal de population, et ce, de certaines zones occupées de l'Ukraine vers la Fédération de Russie, et on parle ici principalement d'enfants. » Les preuves semblent irréfutables. Comme l'a déclaré sans détour le haut commissaire des Nations unies aux droits de l'homme, M. Volker Tuk, Turc, devant le Conseil des droits de l'homme le mois dernier, des enfants ukrainiens ont été transférés vers des territoires 